Linear interpolation, or LERP, is pretty simple. If you've got two numbers, doesn't matter what they are, and you want to get the number halfway between them, then that's a times a half plus b times a half. If you only wanted, say, one quarter of the way between a and b, that's a times three quarters plus b times a quarter. And if you wanted, say, the opposite, say three quarters of the way between a and b, then that's a times a quarter plus b times three quarters. This generalizes to an easy formula. For a value of t between 0 and 1, you can calculate a percentage between them as b times t plus a times 1 minus t, often expressed as a plus b minus a times t. This is all pretty simple so far, but what's crazy useful is that last parameter t, and let's dive into why exactly. This is a graph of t from 0 to 1. We'll refer to it as f at t or function of t, meaning that we have a function that takes t as a parameter and returns some sort of floating point value. In this case, our function is just returning t. What goes in comes back out. Simple as that. We've also got this little ball. So as t goes from 0 to 1, we interpolate the ball's position between left and right using f at t as the parameter to lerp. All good so far? Now, what happens if we take that function, and instead of just returning t, we mess around with it a bit? We'll keep the start and end values the same for now. That is to say, when t equals 0, the function returns 0. And when t equals 1, the function returns 1. But now we'll return t squared, or t times t. Well, the graph would change. Now you've got this second curved line drawing over the top, and you've got a second ball moving left to right. But the behavior is slightly different. It takes a second to accelerate before zooming across. This is illustrating an important concept. You're now shaping the curve, and depending on exactly how you shape it, as the ball moves from left to right, it now travels a slightly different path. It still starts and stops at exactly the same time, but with t times t, it takes a moment to start moving from zero before racing towards the end point. With t cubed, it takes even longer to start up, but once it does, it moves very quickly. You can go the other way as well, taking the square root of t, which is interesting because it starts quickly, but then decelerates before the end point. Or we can use this super handy function called smooth step, and the plot of the graph curves just a bit near the start and end. Enough so that when you watch the ball move, it starts slow, speeds up, and then slows down again, giving a smooth start and stop effect. Now there's a zillion different shaping functions out there. There's really no point going through them one by one. Instead, the important takeaway is to understand how they change behavior. You can ease in, ease out, go back and forth, bounce, etc. just by plugging in a shaping function. And what's even neater is that you can compose functions by lerping between them. So say I start with x squared, which gives me this nice slow start. And I also have 1 minus 1 minus x squared, which gives me a slow finish. Then I can lerp between those two functions, giving me a third function, which happens to be smooth step. So congrats, you just derived smooth step. Now I said this was crazy useful, and it totally is. Let's say that you've got two colors. Well, blending between them is a simple lerp operation, giving you some value between those two. Add two more colors down below, and then lerp between those. That gives you a second result. Now you can go off and lerp between the two results. And voila, you've got bilinear filtering. The exact same method the GPU uses when sampling textures. And you can take it a step further and run the t values through, say, smooth step. And you've suddenly got an improved version of bilinear filtering. It's really up to you. Say you want to pop a UI element onto the screen, like this. So that involves running a bounce function on the UI scaling value, or slide it onto the screen. You can apply a 1 minus 1 minus x squared. That gives you a gradual slowdown as it reaches its end point. Once they're on the screen, you can animate one towards the corner. But that doesn't quite look right because it's just a linear interpolation. So the second one uses smooth step for both the scale and position. And notice how much smoother it looks. Those tiny details matter. Let's get rid of those by applying a smooth step on the alpha towards zero. There are some traps to watch out for. Most things can be safely interpolated. Stuff like positions, colors, angle, scaling, or game-specific values, health, distance, that sort of stuff. But let's take the case of directions. Here we have two unit length directions, and we want to interpolate between them. If you do a straight lerp between them, the result vector looks mostly okay, but let's look a little deeper. I'll change the angle of the vectors to face further away from each other. And now when you look at the interpolated vector, you can see the problem clearly. It's getting shortened pretty badly. Renormalizing the vector helps a lot. 
And honestly, in many situations, like shaders, they just kind of live with the problem. If the angle is small, you'll be okay. Otherwise, you need to learn about slurp. And slurp stands for spherical linear interpolation. And we won't dive into the math. The key thing to understand is that unit direction vectors lie on the surface of a sphere. So just straight interpolation is bound to have errors. Instead, you interpolate across the sphere, like the purple arrow was doing. When the angle between the two is small, the error is small. But the wider we go, the more problematic it becomes. I said scaling was okay, and now here we are suddenly talking about scaling. It's mostly true, until it isn't. Let's say you want to zoom in or out on an object. So we've got our little object here, and we'll zoom in and out. And the first thing you notice is that perceptually, it isn't smooth. It feels like you're covering the majority of the zoom in the first fraction of a second. Contrast that to the right half. So on the right, we're doing a logarithmic interpolation. We're taking the log of the values, doing a lerp on those instead, and this ends up feeling way more natural. And of course, you can combine this with, say, smooth step to get a nice start-stop on top of everything else. The scaling issue highlights the advantages of linear interpolation through another space. The results can be subtle, but perceptually better. Interpolating colors is easy. We can interpolate between a yellow and a blue RGB values through RGB space. And you get a gradient similar to this. But there's a bit of strangeness to it. Look at how in the middle here, we get this weird shift through slightly reddish colors. Doing the lerp through linear color space looks a bit better, but it still has the problem. But if we convert the colors to another color space, like say OK Lab, perform the lerp there, and then convert back, you end up with a gradient that's arguably perceptually nicer, more what you'd expect if you were to draw it yourself. Damping is another common use for lerp. That is doing an interpolation between our current position and a moving position, a moving target. We want to interpolate towards it, following it in essence. And the most common way is to simply interpolate some fixed fraction between our current position and the desired position every frame. But if we split this into two separate instances with two separate frame rates, you see that they behave differently, because this isn't frame rate independent. Almost everybody then takes the delta of the frame time and feeds that into the lerp, hoping that solves the problem, which it almost does. You could be forgiven for thinking it was working. But if we take the difference in the positions, we can clearly see they're close, but there's a difference there. And this is exactly the kind of problem that's absolutely infuriating to track down later. One real, actual frame rate independent way to lerp is like this t equals 1 minus k to the power of time elapsed for some k value. The whole reason behind this is associativity of multiplication for exponents. The general idea is that b to the power of m plus n is equal to b to the power n plus b to the power m. So that lerp of a, b, and t should equal to, say, lerp of lerp a, b, and t and a half, b, and t and a half. Now, this isn't a rigorous mathematical proof, but I've quickly worked through the expansion here, which you can kind of glance through if you're interested. Hopefully, I didn't get anything too wrong here. Anyway, got a little weird there at the end, but maybe you picked up some tricks. Until next time, cheers.